we have reached a tipping point. ESG and private equity is now considered across asset classes and all geographies. That's Dr. Axel Seaman, a leader in Bain's sustainability and corporate responsibility practice and one of Bain's leading advisors on ESG strategies. ESG awareness has become mainstream and now ESG action has to become mainstream too. Today on Dry Powder, we'll consider what happens as the private equity industry approaches this tipping point where ESG adoption may no longer be the exception, but the rule. I'm Hugh MacArthur, head of Bain's global private equity practice, and this is Dry Powder. So the last time we discussed ESG on Dry Powder, it was autumn of 2020, a very different time from today in in many ways. How has the space evolved since that time? Well, recent is the broader ESG adoption from a value perspective. And what we mean by value is how ESG can be instrumental to fundraise better, invest better, own better, and exit better. Secondly, we've seen more ESG regulation recently. Just think of Europe with the EU taxonomy, CSDR and SFDR. ESG is such a strong trend also because it is increasingly regulated, like it or not. That is different from digital. Now, we tend to think of ESG as one thing because it's three letters put together, but of course, it's actually much more than one thing. Do you see firms leaning more into the E, environmental, the S, social, or G, governance, or is it all of the above? Is there there one thing that's being emphasized more or less than others in the market? I'd say it's all of the above. Behind the three letters are 15 to 20 sub-dimensions, and one level down, there are 150 KPIs you can consider. Therefore, a great ESG strategy would not focus on just one ESG dimension. If you look at funds like EQT, Bank Capital, and Astoc, all of them have ESG ambitions which cover multiple ESG dimensions. Also, ESG materiality differs a lot by industry. Therefore, for a generalist private equity firm, a focus on one dimension is not advisable. Nevertheless, we see three themes mostly. Two in E, which is decarbonization and circularity, and one in S, which is the ENI. Interestingly, emphasis in Europe is more on E. In the US, the ENI is more pronounced. Fascinating. Now, Axel, you mentioned earlier that governments and regulatory issues were really pushing ESG to the forefront of, of private equity as well as all different kinds of investing. How seriously beyond that do you think private equity firms are pursuing ESG strategies? We know that regulations and LP interest is really driving and pushing GPs to actually address the issue. But is this something that they're seriously pursuing as a part of their strategy and their operations? Or is this something that they feel like it's another thing I need to do to make regulators happy or to make LPs happy? Very good question. So I think private equity is very serious about ESG. In 2018 to 2020, when private equity became more interested in ESG 2.0, most discussions were about what's new in ESG and why to focus on it, or possibly not. At that time, many in the industry wouldn't have known what Carbon Scope 3 means, and DEI was somewhat limited to gender diversity. This has drastically changed. And all discussions now are around the how can we integrate ESG effectively throughout the deal cycle and at fund level. I think a tangible indicator for seriousness are private equities' commitments around decarbonization. Nearly 90 private equity firms representing 700 billion AUM had signed up to initiative Climate International ahead of COP26. And maybe more important, at least a dozen private equity firms already have or committed to set 1.5 degree science-based targets. Not least, to implement these commitments, ESG hiring at fund level has accelerated dramatically. We have seen five times as many new hires in 2021 compared to 2019. And with profiles shifting from investor relations and legal backgrounds to ESG, finance and business backgrounds. Another interesting aspect here is that the ESG folks get increasing decision authority. One would not do all of that just for window dressing. You've discussed quite a bit that LPs are really taking ESG seriously. Uh, What kind of data or facts do you have that actually back that contention? 
I think that's a very good question because obviously LPs are a very important stakeholder group for private equity firms. And we have just conducted a survey together with ILPA, the Institutional Limited Partners Association, and had astonishing findings. For example, over 90% of LPs said there are ESG-related reasons to walk away from potential investment. And 50% of respondents believe that ESG is additive to investment performance. Thirdly, over 60% of LPs expect in the next three years to have A, increased ESG investment allocation share, B, changes in ESG reporting requests to GPs, and C, changes in in-house ESG capabilities. And let me maybe continue by saying that everybody knows the notion of ticking the box. Obviously, in former times, there were already LP questionnaires out there to GPs checking was there a scandal, not necessarily at fund level, but in the portfolio, any incidences that, you know, needed to have been managed. But what we are seeing now is that the ESG due diligence that LPs are doing on GPs, it's much more extensive. There's much more data to be provided, much more sensitivity around, you know, uh, the metrics. It's much more, by the way, quantitative. Formerly, it was more qualitative. So we see a lot of gearing up on the side of LPs, and we believe leading GPs have very well understood that. Maybe not all of the GPs have already heard the, the bell ring, if you wish. You mentioned the deal life cycle. I'd be interested to understand if you're seeing any shifts in deal making as a result of ESG. Yes, on multiple dimensions. We've seen several new vehicles launched that have an explicit mandate to invest behind themes like climate transition and transition of food systems. Examples are the decarbonization fund by Riverstone and the TPG Rice Climate Fund. On deal level, we see increasing deals in climate tech and carbon markets. Just think of Vitruvian investing in climate partner, TPG buying two carbon offset developers, or KKR buying ERM. Private equity can play a vital role to actually fund and thereby drive these big transitions in mobility, energy, and food systems, and so on, and make good returns. If, for example, you understood the electric vehicle trend early enough and invested in Tesla, you made very good returns. Co2 was able to do that. The 2021 share of energy and utilities deals versus the five-year average declined while healthcare and tech gained. ESG might be one driving force behind that shift. And further, we have evidence for aborted due diligence because of a too challenging ESG profile. Just a couple of weeks ago, a fund decided to pull out of a deal for a private jet leasing company based on ESG concerns. Perfect. So Axel, you've convinced me now that we have actually reached a tipping point with ESG. I'd be very interested if you see any early evidence that ESG is paying off financially. Are we doing well by doing good? That's the holy grail question. There's a lot of evidence in public markets, and we are working on proving that also in private markets. Anecdotic evidence, of course, we have, and we have uh, shared some of the examples in uh, our reports and earlier podcasts. Challenges we are wrestling with is the recency of ESG and private equity and ESG data being still too shaky for systematic proof of causality. Having said that, there are multiple ESG actions which immediately pay off when cost can be lowered or market share can be gained. But let's not be naive. There are obviously hard nuts to crack, including decarbonization of energy-intensive assets, establishing circular business models, and the cultural shifts needed to foster DEI. It'll be fascinating to see the returns on these deals as they become more evident over the next couple of years. But Axel, let's shift gears now and talk a little bit about what specifically private equity firms are doing operationally to put ESG into action. How do the leading private equity firms ensure that their ESG strategies are adopted at both the firm level themselves as a GP, but also at the portfolio company level? Clearly, several aspects of adoption. We see ESG plays a larger role in due diligence and certainly in work prior to exits. And we see the above mentioned capability building, including and not mentioned yet the adoption of SaaS solutions to monitor ESG developments in portfolio companies. 
The now larger ESG teams of partly five to six FTEs obviously help to drive adoption. And this again enables funds to leverage ESG expertise as a differentiating factor. And portfolio companies benefit from the expertise at fund level and in cross-portfolio experience sharing. And may I say, the pledges mentioned before also drive adoption. Blackstone's pledge to reduce energy consumption in every new portfolio company by 15% during the first three years of ownership, of course, we expect action is taken. Another element of adoption are sustainability-linked loans for portfolio companies. Strategic Value Partners refinanced its packaging business Glockner Pentaplast with a 1 billion sustainability-linked loan. And EQT actually has a dedicated vehicle for sustainability-linked loans. A further interesting nuance, at a recent conference, one fund shared that all its portfolio companies have executive bonuses linked to ESG. It was said the ESG linked portion is one third, not a small number. And at portfolio company level, we now see everything we also see at public corporates for a while. They publish sustainability reports, build ESG related ecosystems, define ESG strategies, build stronger ESG teams, innovate, and through that aim to capture value from ESG and mitigate the risks. Axel, you've just described a tremendous amount of activity. In fact, I'm a little bit blown away by how many things are going on and what actual leading GPs are doing. How do they actually do that and manage the cost and complexity of all of these new activities and requirements? Indeed, ESG doesn't come for free. ESG, right now, it is an additional management dimension. You need everything from creating transparency, setting targets, managing towards targets, and communication. A portfolio company CEO told me, before we had eight KPIs we were measured on, now we have 11. Many will have read also the recent SEC announcement, if an IPO is planned, companies will need to report from 2024 onwards carbon information. For this, ESG tools, carbon tools are necessary too. At fund level, all portfolio companies' ESG information has to be rolled up, managed, and reported. Also here, ESG data providers and ESG software, such as from Ecovaris and Persephone, play an increasingly important role. In essence, ESG requires investment. If done smartly, benefits are largely exceeding the invest. So what you're describing, Axel, is really a couple of forces for urgency here in getting an ESG program that is real and in place as rapidly as possible for GPs. You know, firstly, the lifeblood of your industry, which is LPs, are taking this much, much more seriously and demanding transparency and metrics and reality uh, than, than they have in the past. And secondly, as we discussed, and I'm euphemistically saying this, but if people under 40, which is a greater and greater share of customers out there, don't want to buy your product or service and don't want to work for your company or be retained by your company if you're not really walking the walk, if you will, on ESG programs and sustainability, to me, that would get me out of bed pretty quickly as a GP and say to myself, I've got to get going here. But where are some of the barriers here that are preventing private equity firms from moving even faster on ESG adoption? Why can't we seem to get to the end game quickly? Well, that's that's a great question. And, you know, is private equity not going fast enough? One could argue it is, given where the industry is now relative to three to four years ago. But I tend to agree we are probably just at the end of the beginning. So what's challenging? I'd say the change management required in private equity firms, where a lot of decision power resides with deal teams, and hence many have to be convinced of the ESG benefits. And then there is uncertainty around taxonomy and regulation, and private equity-focused ESG products to help funds drive adoption are just emerging. And portfolio companies, where the true ESG impact lies, face similar issues than any corporate. Technical solutions still need to be developed in a cost-competitive way and or subsidized. Just think of green hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, recycling infrastructure, and so on. And what's often neglected, ESG topics are interrelated and partly in conflict to each other. For example, less plastic food packaging may mean less food safety and possibly more food waste because of lower shelf lives. More wind energy has an impact on biodiversity and so on. As we speak transitions, this cannot be done overnight. 
And what's our role in all of this, Axel? How is Bain actually helping our private equity clients accelerate the adoption of these ESG practices? We had invested in ESG ahead of demand, building our team, building an ecosystem of partners, knocking on many doors to raise awareness. We are putting in place an ESG ring fence team to support our clients with ESG ad hoc delivery capability. And we work on automating parts of the ESG assessments. We now have a run rate of dozens of ESG assessments, and we plan to embed ESG into all of our products. This is also because ESG factors are strongly linked to financial outcomes as markets will price in ESG stories. So as a buyer, you better understand how real the story is and whether the ESG program will achieve anticipated returns. And especially in exit preparation, it is important as future owners expect to understand the ESG profile and plan before signing. On the next episode of Dry Powder, I'll ask Axel about the emergence of ESG ratings and to what extent they can make your ESG initiatives measurable and ultimately more manageable. Across your portfolio, you would see what is the carbon footprint, what are the key components of it, what are the action possibilities that you can do and how can you manage it over time. I'm Hugh MacArthur. Thank you for listening.